serve, so it's a nice program. Um, and then uh, Meals on Wheels. Most people know Sage for Meals on Wheels. I guess because we serve like 250,000 meals or something ridiculous each year, so it's, a, it's an incredible program. Um, we do Meals on Wheels delivery for Northern Union County, Milburn, Short Hills, and Chatham. And uh, we have uh, lots of devoted volunteers that we're very fortunate to have who deliver the meal. And that meal becomes often a daily check-in for an older adult who may not otherwise see someone that day or even that week. And so um, it's a very nice visit for, for someone in the community. So we do Meals on Wheels, and then out of Meals on Wheels grew our grocery shopping and errand program. So we also <coughs> will um, shop for individuals who need it and bring their groceries to them, and often the volunteer and the individual develop a great relationship because the volunteers tell me, you know, I, they, they'll know Mrs. Jones likes her peaches more ripe, and, you know, <laughs> Mr. Smith asked for his milk to be backdated in two weeks. You know, they really know the ins and outs of their uh, clients, which is neat. Um, we have a bill paying program, so we help people either sort through their finances and figure out what, what bills are due. Sometimes the person um, all of a sudden needs to take over bill paying responsibilities and they're not used to it, so they need someone to set up a system for them, or some people are visually impaired and they have a hard time um, reading their bills and figuring out how to write their checks. So um, we have volunteers who are um, bonded and background checked, etc., who, who help with that. And home repair. Um, we have a, a, out of our big fall prevention initiative, and I know some of you in the room have been to our fall prevention forums, we're doing um, a home repair service, so we put up grab bars in people's homes, we can take air conditioners in and out, we hang curtains, we fix um, leaky faucets, you know, those kind of things. And then we have a whole information and education portion of SAGE. And um, we want to be one-stop shopping for people's needs on elder care, on caregiving issues, on um, information and referrals for what's available in your community. So we have a social worker who runs an info care program is what we call it, who can answer questions and provide lists of resources. And we also have um, a planning and guidance program that's run by a nurse who's here, <laughs> who um, the planning and guidance program can help people determine, you know, some next steps, what you may need in your future. Maybe you have a, a situation changed in your life. You may have been newly diagnosed with um, an illness that you need to deal with, or you may have uh, new caregiving responsibilities and you want to have a plan and, and talk to an expert who can help you make that plan, um, assess your home, assess your family situation, and, and see what um, resources can be provided for you. So we do that as well. And then we love to have all of these opportunities here. So this is one of our um, community events that we hold. And if you're not on the mailing list and you'd like to be, you know, that's why we have a sign-in sheet as well. So um, we'd like to get you on that. Um, and SAGE is a nonprofit organization, so we do rely on the community support to continue programming such as this. Um, we have a resale shop off campus at, um, on Chatham Road off of River Road. The resale shop, had, um, do, you can donate your items and purchase, buy, what am I trying to say? Buy goods, go shopping. <laughs> and the, um, they're a tremendous resource to the organization. And we also have a workshop in the, in the lower level. That's what the workshop volunteers like to call it. It's all volunteer run and led. Um, and the volunteers specialize in caning and rushing chairs and refinishing furniture. And all the proceeds go back to support the organization. They raised about $60,000 last year for the organization, and they think they're going to surpass that this year. So very fortunate to have that. Um, and Mary, should, does anyone have any questions? Oh, you forgot me. Oh, you know, and I said, like, Kay's here, so I won't forget. <laughs> All right. Our newest service is um, <laughs> our newest service. How can I forget? Is holistic living and Sage. We don't count if you forget, right? We don't make fun of anyone who can't remember anything. Um, so our newest service is holistic living. Our holistic living program is is based in our home care department, but you do not need to be a home care client to take advantage of this. Um, we have a nurse who's also a certified massage therapist and certified in healing touch and all sorts of other great relaxation techniques. I should just let you speak. 
Go ahead, you're doing a great job. All right. Um, and, and Kay, as a nurse, can go into your home to offer in-home massage therapy. It's great for, um, she specializes in geriatric massage, oncology massage, um, hospice, hospice massage. We do, keep, she does healing touch, breathing exercises, guided meditation, relaxation. She can do it in her home or actually at Sage. Um, so it's a new program. It's an added benefit to those who join our home care department because then we have aides who are also trained in um, hands and foot massage and things. But it's another way that you can be well, you know, with, with uh, Sage. So that's holistic living. There's brochures and information about a lot of what I talked about at your seat, but also at the front counter on your way out. So if you want to grab anything. Okay, now are there any questions? Does anyone want to meet Kay? <laughs> yeah. Me too. I want to go right out right now. So we're thrilled tonight to have uh, Mary McHugh here. Mary is the author of 20 books. She's written extensively for the New York Times and Family Circle and Good Housekeeping. You've served as the editor, right, in a lot of those national Our publica editor. publications. Um, She's published, as I said, 20 books on the subjects ranging from fem feminism to crotchety old men. Some of her books are, are here at the front. Um, works for the New York Times for special sections like Sophisticated Traveler and Fashions of the Times. And, um, and you also had um, some things nominated, like family, your articles for Family Circle have been nominated for awards by the American Society of Magazine Editors. So your work's appeared in a lot of places. You, are you still having your online TV show? Uh, no, that's uh, on hold. Yes. Okay, on hold. But well, we're, we're very happy to have Mary here. Mary also had some books for sale at the front, and she's donating half the proceeds of the books to Sage, so oh, which is very nice. Um, but I think we're in for a real treat, so without further ado. whoever she is. So, <laughs> I, 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 I'm really interested in aging because I think it's so different now than it, from our Mother's Day and our Grandmother's Day, you know. Um, it's partly, I think, a better diet. Maybe we exercise a little bit. But I think it's mostly that we have more interests now. You know, after our children are raised, we still have lives. We still have interesting things that we do, volunteer things that we do. And so uh, I f I'm finding it fairly interesting. And I have to tell you one funny story that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm a hospice volunteer, and I, it's one of the best experiences of my life. It's very rewarding, very interesting. I've met wonderful people, and um, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. So I went to a residential place. Uh, it was like assisted living. Uh, on Springfield, it was Spring Meadow, someplace like that. And so I went in, and I was waiting for my hospice patient to come. And a lady came up, wheeled up to me, nice-looking lady, white hair, in a wheelchair. So she said to me, who's Wells Fargo? <laughs> so I said, um, well, Wells Fargo is actually a bank. So she said, well, she didn't hear me very well, so she said, well, why is, she send is he sending me birthday cards. So I thought, she, she had a birthday card. It had all been signed by people in the bank, you know, so and it was nice everything. I said, oh, it's your birthday. Congratulations. And she said, yes, she said, I am 100 years old today, and my son is giving me a party. I said, that's wonderful. Happy birthday. And then she said, and she really did say this, she said, do I look it? <laughs> and I thought, 
gee, when do you get to the point, like 97 or 98, don't you get to some point where you think, oh, you don't ask how that, it's not true. You get to 100, 110, 120, you still say, how do I look? So, uh, so I just, I, I think, I just love the whole idea that um, we are aging in a different way than we used to, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting period of, and I think it's the fastest, people over 80, are the fastest growing part of the population. I think that's true. I think I read that in the Times. So, today, um, I'll talk partly about aging, but mostly about women, and, and um, I ask the indulgence of the nice men in this audience because it's not a man bashing thing. It's just, you know, an appreciation of women, kind of. So, I want to give you my rules of life because we all need rules of life. The first one is, Never give yourself a haircut after three margaritas. <laughs> Follow the best advice your mother gave you, which was go. You might meet somebody. <laughs> Follow the advice of the Duke of Windsor a long time ago, who used to say, never give up a chance to take a nap, eat, or pee. <laughs> and um, also, never lend your car to somebody to whom you have given birth. <laughs> but my favorite is, Laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and you cry with your women friends. I do not know what I do without my women friends. They're there. If, if something wonderful happens, we have some champagne together. If something difficult comes along, I've got people to talk to. They always know the right things to say. I just, I just treasure them. I think they're wonderful. But my, this is my big rule here is, no matter how serious life requires you to be, and God knows it does, Try to have some friends you can do something goofy with. And I want to tell you about two of my friends that I can do nutty things with, and I just love it. Um, I used to live up in uh, Richmond, Bergen County, and my best friend lives up there. Her name is Betsy. I've known her for like 100 years. So every August, we used to go into New York to Macy's Tapathon. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that here, but it's they would have it on an August morning, a hot August morning, and we would go, and you get there at 8 o'clock, and there would be about 6,000 of us. 6,000 people coming to tap dance. And we tap danced between, um, on 34th Street, in front of Macy's, between Broadway and 7th. So Betsy and I would always say, well, we've danced on Broadway. So <laughs> we would get there. And they give you some kind of Disney shirt or some cartoon, like a, a goofy shirt, a T-shirt, and a hat, or a Betty Boop you know, t-shirt and a garter and everything. So we put those on, and then these nice tap captains would take groups of 20 and teach us this uh, simple tap step. It was very simple routine, but Betsy and I kept forgetting. But we, we just struggled through. We finally, we learned it, sort of. We figured if we made a mistake, who's going to notice with 6,000 people, right? And there were people of all ages. There were little kids, and there were young mothers with their children, and there were older people, some of whom had been professional tap dancers, and they just came to do this. So we would go and, and practice the steps. Then we would go and get coffee, come back at 12 o'clock, and at noon, we would all get out on 34th Street and do this tap routine twice. The news helicopters flew overhead so that the tops of our heads were on the news that night. <laughs> and it was, it was just the most fun. And then Betsy and I would go and find a really nice restaurant, still in our goofy t-shirts and everything, and eat up all the calories that we had danced off. But it was the most fun. Unfortunately, the brave woman who organized this every year finally retired. And there isn't another person on the face of the earth who can organize 6,000 people into doing a dance, you know, in front of Macy's. So it's too bad, because we miss that. So, and the other uh, person that I can do nutty things with is also up in Ridgewood. Her name is Jane. And she has a party every, about twice a year, for what she calls the girlfriends. And there are a bunch of, like, 30 or 40 of us who've known each other forever, and we catch up on everything. And so a couple of years ago, she said, I want you to uh, do something for us that you've never done before. So I thought and thought, and I, well, I thought, well, I'll do my world famous imitation of bacon frying. And the reason I say world famous is that I actually did this. I had the nerve to do this in Scotland. Um, a lot of, uh, because I worked for these women's magazines, and I was once a travel editor, 
I got to go on all these press trips where we got to go places for free, which was really good. I went on the Orient Express one time and to Australia, to Rio. And this was a scotch whiskey tour. <laughs> now, I don't even like scotch. I mean, I used to be a bourbon drinker, but anyway, I don't like But anyway, we would go and we'd be <laughs> sipping scotch at 11 in the morning. We had like a buzz on all day long. You know? <laughs> but we went to all different distilleries on little islands in, um, in Scotland. And it was just the most fun. And at the end, they held a big party for us. So they, they sang and danced. You know, I had expected them to be not quite so delightful. My, I am of Scottish descent. And so I thought they'd all be sort of like my father, who was a wonderful father, and I adored him. And he was funny, but he was also quite doer. So I thought, gee, well, Scotland means doer, but it didn't at all. We did line dancing. They sang for us. They played instruments for us. They were so great. They sang the Scottish National Anthem, in which they declared their freedom from England, which I think they're still waiting for that to happen. But it was wonderful. We just had the best time. And so then the host of this whole thing said, now we would like our American visitors to perform for us. And we, nobody told us they were going to say that. But the day before, after a wee dram, I had said to our, our leader, you know, oh, I do this impression of bacon frying. So she stood up at the party and she said, Mary McHugh will now do her impression of bacon frying. In a whole room full of nice Scottish people who weren't expecting this at all. So um, I went up to the front of this room and I was all dressed up. I had on a nice wool dress and pearls and pearl earrings and everything and heels, you know, and stockings and all. And so I got up there I said, I hope you can indulge me in what I do, and I hope you will indulge me. I don't know if you can see. In the back, you might want to stand up. It doesn't take very long, but this is what I did for these people. Can you see me if I do it here? All right. <laughs> <laughs> this is in my nice wool dress. So I'll open one favor, 
I need to go to the garage to pick up my car because I had it fixed and I need you to come with me. I'll drive, but let's go do that. So they got in the car, the children in the back, and they drove, and they drove, and they drove. And the mother realized that they were not going to the garage. She said, where are we going, honey? And the daughter said, Mom, you'll never forgive yourself if you miss this. So they pulled up in front of a little church, got out of the car, and took the children by the hand. They walked around to the back of the church, and there was a hillside, a whole acre, a hillside, planted with daffodils, but in different ribbons of color, so that you have one ribbon of lemon yellow, and then one of saffron pink, and one of white, all different, can you picture this with all these ribbons coming down, and this beautiful, beautiful hillside. So the mother said, who did this? And the daughter said, there's a little uh, house up at the top, well, I'll show you. So they went up, and there was a sign up there that said, answers to questions you're probably asking yourself. And the first one was 50,000 bulbs. The second was one woman with two hands, two feet, and very little brain. <laughs> that started in 1958. And so that's the daffodil principle. One woman working one bulb at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time, had it changed her environment into such a beautiful place that people came from miles around to admire what she had done. And I think that's what all of you do. I think when you come to a place, you do that one bulb at a time, one child at a time, one church at a time, one community at a time. You work little by little to make the environment that you're in better than it was when you got there. And I think that's how women change the world, you know, little bit little bits at a time, not just all in one fell swoop, but one little bit at a time. So there it was, the daffodil principle. And I, oh, and I also wanted to, uh, I remembered, speaking of daffodils, that after 9-11, a million and a half daffodil bulbs were sent to New York by people all over the world who wanted to say something kind to New York, and 10,000 volunteers planted them all over, up and down Park Avenue and in little parks around the city and everything. And of course, every year daffodils come back again, which I think is like a symbol that you can't kill the spirit of the people in this country. Keep coming back and coming back, even after something terrible like 9-11. So that's, my, that, that's what the daffodils um, represent to me. So, if someone asks you to come and see the daffodils, go. Don't say next week or sometime or later on or I'll do it when I get around to it. Um, just do it now. Um, I have a list of 101 things to do before I die. Uh, while I can still do them, I've done uh, some of them. But I haven't have done things like going up in a hot air balloon on my birthday with champagne, something like that. But one thing I did do, and it was on another of those press trips that I took. We went, it was in Miami. And they took us to the uh, Miami um, Aquarium to swim with dolphins. And I know, it's, I think it's that's not, not politically correct to swim with dolphins anymore, but then it was. So we went in, and they gave us a, a, a wetsuit to put on. And I wish I had one all the time. It takes your whole body up and leaves it there. Yeah, it keeps, just keeps it up here. It's the best thing. It's just so good. So you get in this little lagoon, and the dolphin comes up. They introduce you to your dolphin, and you grab the fin, and it zooms across the lagoon. Then you take its tail, and it zooms back. And then they say, do you want to hug your dolphin goodbye? Of course you do, so you go like this. The dolphin comes up. You hug the dolphin goodbye. And it's just the best experience. And the day I was there, there was a young couple who swam with a dolphin. And afterwards, he proposed to her. And they took pictures. And luckily, she said yes, and they proposed to her, uh, and they had pictures. And um, I thought, how wonderful if this marriage lasts a long time, that they would remember that he proposed to her while they were swimming with dolphins. I just thought that was a nice mm -hmm. thing for him to think of to do. Mm -hmm. So there are, as I say, so many other things. I think of life as a series of adventures. Even when things are really rough, if you can think of the things that you can do or think of ways to have adventures, it's, um, I think it helps you through this life. 
So in this latest book I wrote, um, which is called, I told you, Aging with Grace, where she is, um, it's divided into sliding through your 50s, sailing through your 60s, triumphing over your 70s, and enjoying your 80s. And in the last part, enjoying your 80s, I have uh, just a few adventures I wanted to tell you about, because you might want to do them. You might want to, or might not, but anyway, I'll tell you about them. Uh, the first one is take a tap dancing class, which is, I told you I loved to do. I, uh, I was back in the generation when mothers took their children and learned tap dancing because of Shirley Temple. You know, there were all these movies, Shirley Temple tapping along. So <laughs> I didn't quite make it into the movies, but I did ha have a love of tap dancing that I love, and I will inflict that on you later at the end. Um, but that was fun, and it's good exercise. And the second one, another adventure that I have that I had done before, find an island. I didn't know about Governor's Island until a couple of years ago, but you can go to the foot of Manhattan and get on a free ferry boat and that takes you across to Governor's Island. And I went because Judy Collins was there and she was singing, so I wanted to go. But you can take a little car that goes all the way around the island. There are artworks all over the place. And it's just, and there's a little restaurant. It's a, it's a wonder, it was a wonderful experience. And I loved it. And another thing you can do is visit a winery. Um, even if you don't drink the wine, you can go in the gift shop. They have great Christmas presents and birthday presents and Valentine's Day presents. So wine, that's very good for that. I do drink the wine, but... <laughs> um, oh, and another thing. I just had the great joy of having my first great-grandchild born to my oldest grandson. Oh, it's so much fun to have a little one again, you know, and hug her. And, and so naturally, I spend my days in the toy stores <laughs> trying to find my go to Toys R Us and anything else. So go to a toy store is another thing, because they have all sorts of new things now. You know, doll houses and things they didn't have when I was buying for my grandchildren. So that's, that's another thing. And, oh, and another thing is Read the Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it sort of helps you. There's exercises, and it shows you how to make your life creative, whether you're, you know, writing or painting or anything, just make a, make a, makes your life more creative. I love that book. It sort of changed my life. Another was go on a house tour. I had never done that before. And then I joined the Thursday Morning Club after I spoke there. Um, and they had a house tour. So I went around. And in one house, I remember, there was um, like a framed saying on the wall with a, um, a picture of a, of a little boy. And it said, I think of you in colors that don't exist. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was the most wonderful way to describe somebody you love. You know, that, that it's such a deep love and such a wonderful love that there, you can't find the right colors to describe it. So I thought that was a great thing to have on the wall. So now I like house doors. I'm going to do that again. Uh, now this one, I don't think it's going to appeal to many people, but I have to tell you, uh, you can make your own YouTube. I have shamelessly made um, about 30 of them and talking about my books and tap dancing at the end and hearing from perverted people in Germany. <laughs> 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 but it, it is fun to do, and um, it's just, it's easy to do. But anyway, I realize that's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, another one is give an interesting women's brunch. I learned this from one of my daughters. She, was, she lived in Boston, and she would meet different women uh, as she went along, and she want, wanted to get to know them better, so she would give an interesting women's brunch and introduce all these interesting women to each other and get to know them, and it, it, it's a good thing, so I try to do that every once in a while. I learn a lot from my daughters, as you can see. Uh, another one is by a keyboard. Uh, when I was little, my parents made me take piano lessons, and I hated it, but I did learn to read music, and when I got older, I thought, oh, I wish I had a piano. I'd like to go back to doing that again. And I didn't have a piano. So my daughter, my younger daughter, surprised me by, for my, this is for my 70th birthday, she bought a keyboard and she wrote in secret to all my friends and she said, send sheet music that means something to Mary. You know, just say something on it, you know, happy birthday, but pick something. So I would get... Um, one of them was New York, New York, which I love, and another was Les Feuilles Mortes, because I once lived in Paris, and I love everything French. And there were different ones that meant something to me, and um, they, they would write personal messages on it. So it was one of the best 
birthday presents I ever had. It was just such a great thing to do. But I recommend buying a keyboard if you have any interest in, in making bad music. And, uh, <laughs> um, oh, and this one is, this adventure is make a few meals that take longer than 17 minutes to make. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've gotten to a point where I've been married for 58 years, so I keep repeating the same, same meals over and over real fast and get it all over with and everything. But then I thought, well, I could go on Epicurious online and get some Bon Appetit and uh, you know, gourmet mac uh, recipes once in a while take a little longer than 17 minutes. So that's, for me, that's that's pretty good. So I do that. Um, then this one, um, I don't know if you've ever. This is so silly, but it was fun. Uh, feng Shui your house. You know, for a while that there was like a, a fad of Feng Shui in your house all the time. So um, you divide the house or your favorite room into nine different sections, and it was things like. Family, reputation, money, spirituality. It was all the different parts of your life. And they told you to put flowers or windmills or something in all those sections and rearrange everything so that your life would suddenly become totally wildly successful. And so I did it. And my life has never become totally wildly successful, but it was fun doing it. So, so um, it's fun to do when you have nothing else to do. Um, and there's another one, Design Your Own Website, which I did. There's, there's one called www.freewebs.com and, and so I did that and did some blogs which nobody ever read and this one um, is also as nutty as, as um, Feng Shui in your house is get a tarot card reading but I had this friend who's a slightly more psychic than um, some other people I know just uh, slightly more and so uh, every once in a while I buy her lunch and she reads my tarot cards and I thought well I don't believe any of this sort of but, you know, I wanted to. So one day I was there, and she said, you're going to be on Oprah's show. And I had just had a new book out. I said, I said to her, do you know how many writers want to be on Oprah's show and how few get on there? She said, no, and she said, I really see this. And the next day, a producer from the Oprah show called me, not about my book, but because they were looking for people who had watched Oprah a long time, and they were going to send them, bring them to Chicago, and then they all went to Australia together. So she interviewed me and everything, and I tried to be sparkling and <laughs> get, get to Australia. I didn't get there, but I thought, well, the tarot card reader said I was going to get a call from Oprah, and at least I got one call from her producer, so I mean, it was sort of okay, you know? So another thing that I do is, besides being a hospice volunteer, I record for the blind and dyslexic in New York, and it's wonderful, because I never know when I come in there what they're going to give me to read. Sometimes it's a it's a textbook, or sometimes it's uh, something in French, or it's interesting and fun, and the people who do it are interesting and fun, because they they pick that as their volunteer activity, people who are retired and everything, so I got to meet a lot of nice people doing that, I love that. And uh, yeah, this is the, the last one, is um, meditate in a bubble bath. I find just to sit in a bubble bath, and just think of nothing, just sort of like meditate and be calm and let let all the cares go. Just there's just it's a lovely thing to do. I think a bubble bath probably ruins your skin forever, but I don't care. I just love being in there. So those are the the adventures that I have in this book. But I am a great advocate of go, going out and finding new things to do because I believe there's no better time to be happy than right now. Um, so and I know you've heard this, but let me do it again. I've heard it a thousand times. <laughs> it's so work as if you don't need the money. Love as if you've never been hurt, and dance as if no one is watching. Because life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breaths away. One of my very favorite writers in the whole world was Irma Bombeck. I still read her books. I love her columns. I love everything. And she was just, I always felt like she was writing directly to me. That she, whatever she was saying, was something that I understood so well. I just loved her. And she wrote a column when she found out she was dying of cancer. She wrote a column called, If I Had My Life to Live Over. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but I wanted to read you a couple of things from it because I just think they're so powerful and meaningful. She said, If I had my life to live over, I would have burned the pink candle sculpted like a rose before it melted in, in storage. I have one of those. I'm going to go get it out. I would have invited friends over to dinner, even if the carpet was stained and the sofa was faded. I would have sat on the lawn with my children and not worried about grass stains. 
I would never have bought anything just because it was practical, wouldn't show the soil, or was guaranteed to last a lifetime. But mostly, given another shot at life, I would seize every minute, look at it and really see it, live it and never give it back. And I love that. I think she, she reminds me so much of a lot of my women friends who are like that. They're humorous and intelligent, strong, wonderful women. And I, I feel very lucky to know those women. And I don't know why, um, but women seem to get through this life with more grace under pressure than men. Um, I ask the forgiveness of the men in here because I'm sure you do live life with grace. Um, it's not that I don't appreciate men. As I said, I have this man living in my house for 58 years now <laughs> that I appreciate and love very much. But if there's just something about women, um, other people have said it better than I can. Uh, one person said, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. A woman must do what he can't. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever women must do, they must do twice as well as men to be thought half as good. Luckily, this is not difficult. <laughs> and uh, this one is particularly apropos right now. When women get depressed, they eat, clean out the closets, or go shopping. Men invade another country. <laughs> <laughs> Behind every successful man is a surprised woman. <laughs> and Margaret Thatcher, who should know, said, In politics, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. And listen to the debates, and I think you'll agree with that one. So, one thing is, that makes us more interesting, I think, is that we're more complicated. I think. I think even God has trouble with us sometimes. There was this story of this man who was walking along the beach in California. And he looked up and he said, God, please grant me one wish. So the Lord looked down and he said, well, you've been a good man. He said, you've you led a good life. I'll, I'll grant you your wish. What is it? So the man said, I would appreciate it if you could build a bridge from here to Hawaii so that I could just drive over there anytime I feel like it. So the Lord said, well, that's not a very good wish. It's not spiritual enough. It's just, that's just not good. He said, you think some more and think of something else. So the man thought, and he thought, and he thought. And finally he said, Lord, I wish I could understand women. I want to know how they feel inside. What they're thinking when they give me the silent treatment. Why they cry. What they mean when they say nothing, when I say, what's the matter? <laughs> and how can I make a woman truly happy? And there was a long pause, and the Lord said, do you want two lanes or four lanes? <laughs> 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 so, there are signs of creeping little old ladyhood, which are in, I have a book called, one of my first books about aging was called How Not to Become a Little Old Lady, which is mostly just um, uh, one-liners and pictures. But the woman who did the illustrations is a woman named Adrienne Hartman, who is a friend of mine. I just want to show you some of these signs of creeping little old ladyhood. Um, if you do most of them, so do I. Um, join the club. If you do all of them, you might want to rethink. But anyway, I'll show you. I hope you can see these in the back. I, they're, they're, I think they're pretty good. But I'll, I'll show them. This is, little old ladies have never seen a ladies' room that was clean enough. <laughs> can you see in the, Can you see in the back? All right. I don't know if you can see back there. And that's that one. Do I agree with this one? Little old ladies think the print in all magazines and newspapers has gotten much smaller. Much smaller right? Much smaller. Yes, definitely. Uh, little old ladies describe their vacations by what they ate. <laughs> you don't hear about the whales jumping over the prow of the boat. You hear about what they had for tea in the afternoon and, and you know, the 11 o'clock bouillon deal. So that's what the little old ladies. This one I love because my mother used to do this. Little old ladies iron their gift wrap paper oh. and use it over again. <laughs> I can remember saying it to my mother about the 80s, you know, Mom, the depre repression, depression is over. Uh, I think you can throw out, get new. So. And this one is, I also identify with this one, 
Little old ladies need their glasses to find their glasses. Um, it's so annoying to have to always pick up the glasses to read anything nowadays. I don't like that, but anyway. So I have the, I get glasses at the pharmacy, like Liz's pharmacy, and I just put them all over the house so that we can find them. And this one is, oh, this one too I identify with. Little old ladies think everybody mumbles these days. <laughs> They're all talking softer. So if you ask me a question later, shout, because I'm having that trouble too. And this one, <clears throat> little old ladies complain about everything. Young people, music, whatever they can think of, rain, anything, little old ladies complain all the time. Little old ladies nap all day and wonder why they can't sleep at night. <laughs> And little old ladies wonder why when they eat a two-pound box of chocolates, they gain five pounds. <laughs> this isn't fair, is it? Yeah. And then this, this last one is, little old ladies are sure that their clothes shrink while they're sitting in the closet. <laughs> that's that's the, the illustrations. And I discovered years ago that my clothes did keep shrinking in the closet. So I keep going on all these diets and, and trying all different things. Um, I did, I just recently, I lost 10 pounds on Jenny Craig because now they, they send things to your house. You don't have to go. And then a counselor calls you on Wednesday. So I did that. And I like her food, so I had been there before. I kept, you know, losing 10 pounds with her and then putting them back on. Um, so... Um, then, and I tried, the, my husband and I tried the South Beach diet, but I was cooking all the time, just night and day cooking, 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 and I said, this is no good. <laughs> so, I invented my uh, chocolate and wine diet. Now, I don't want you to think that I just sit around all day swilling, <laughs> swilling wine and eating chocolate, but I knew I wouldn't stick to a diet if I didn't have, like, a glass of wine with dinner, or if I didn't have a chocolate hit once in a while. So, I found these chocolate cookies. They're only, they're I don't have I don't have any financial interest in this company, by the way, but it's their Balsam cookies, and they're called Africa, spelled with a K in the middle. And they are only 20 calories each, and they're this rich, dark chocolate. I put them downstairs in the freezer, because if I left them upstairs, I would eat the whole box all at once. So I brought some... Well, <laughs> I see several people have discovered how good they are. I brought a couple there, so if you want a cookie, you don't have to buy a book to have a cookie. You just even help yourself to whatever cookies are left there. Where do you buy them? Uh, in the supermarket. They're right with all the other cookies. There's a whole bunch of Balsen cookies. Balsen? B-A-H-L-S-E-N. And the Africa cookies are in there. Okay. They keep disappearing because I keep talking about them in groups like this. <laughs> and the next time when I go, I can't find any uh, of my Africa cookies. So, but, you know, I do love chocolate. And even Jane uh, Brody, you know, the health columnist in the New York Times, mm -hmm. She even recommends chocolate. Um, when I worked at the Times, I used to see Jane Brody in the elevator sometimes, or in the cafeteria, and she always looked like she ate a couple of lettuce leaves, and that's all she had all day long. Very, very thin. But she, even she said, chocolate is replete with substances that may actually enhance well-being, as well as improve one's mind. I thought, whoa, that's good. And then she said, it can stimulate the mind and may delay some of the ravages of advancing age. So there it is, I thought. A cookie here, a cookie there, I've lost 12 pounds, money talks, chocolate sings, and one of my friends says, if there's no chocolate in heaven, I'm not going. <laughs> we all know that we have to exercise for our bones and our heart and everything like that, but there's no sense in overdoing. If you're going to learn cross-country skiing, take up cross-country skiing, pick a small country. <laughs> the one I love best was what um, um, Ellen DeGeneres said. She said, the doctor told my mother to walk five miles a day, and now we don't know where the hell she is. 